presence as we worship him this morning. Let's stand and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, you are good, so, so good. And we have so many reasons to thank you and so many reasons to praise you. And so for these moments to begin, our time together here, our first priority is to tell you of our love, of our gratitude, and of our praise. Lord, your scripture says that your spirit inhabits the space where your people praise you. And so we invite your spirit to be present here with us, to truly inhabit our praises, to make yourself known to us as we set our focus on you. And God, most of all, it's our desire that you would be honored and lifted high as we sing these songs with our voices as we raise our, our voice and our hands to you, as we give our hearts and our minds to you, be honored, we pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Let's sing to him. one thing you're amazing we are miracles standing side by side when our hearts, hearts were dead but you made us alive, alive. you're amazing. amazing every story in life you say put your glory on this way you're the God of amazing you're the God God who delights to be more than we've ever hoped for. There's no end to the power of your name. You're the God of a family. Far beyond our impossibilities. For the things I get seen. Lord, we dare to believe. You're the God of amazing. Long, Long we've settled for so, so much less. But she called us here that to you can express the amazing. For the kingdom, kingdom and for your name, glory on display. You're the God of amazing. You're the God of what cannot be explained. You're the God who delights. And to the power of your name, you're the God of astounding. You're beyond our impossibilities. Dare to sing, dare to believe. You're the God of amazing. Oh, you're the God of amazing.
worship you, Lord. We're going to teach you guys a new song this morning. It has a lot of lyrics, so don't let that get in the way of worshiping this morning. Um, go ahead and just listen and meditate on it and worship. And if you feel like you know it and want to join us, great. And if you don't, don't let that get in the way of worship this morning. We serve an amazing God who is the same today as he was yesterday, way back in the beginning of time. He's the same God, and he chose us, and he loves us. It goes like this. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me. Oh, God, my
We worship you this morning, God. We thank you for your presence. We 
thank you for who you are, for the ways, all the ways you love us. That you are faithful and you are holy. And you are Savior. And we are so grateful and in awe of your glory. Thank you, God. We worship you this morning. Amen. Please be seated. As I was worshiping this morning there, I, the Lord was impressing something on me, so I'm going to share it with you because it might be for someone who's here. Uh, he brought the scripture back to me that says that uh, God makes a way where there is no way. And so some of us are facing situations, they might be a health situation, might be a financial situation, might be a relational situation, where it looks like there's just no way opening up. But God is a God who makes a way where there is no way. Where there's no earthly way, there's a God way. There's a God way. And the other scripture that comes to mind is that the righteous walk by faith and not by sight. When we don't see the way, when we don't see the way, we still can trust the way because God is up to things we don't yet see. God's up to things we don't yet see. So... May that bless whoever's in need of that this morning. So we're going to honor our graduates this morning and our, those who are promoting today. Um, you know, the idea of a milestone. We talk about milestones in life. A milestone actually started in the Roman Empire in Jesus' day. Uh, throughout the Roman Empire, as they built these roads throughout the known world, they would put stones that would say, you're getting closer to your destination. This road is leading here and you're getting closer. And then in the British Empire, they actually conformed the mile to a regular increment, and so there were stones put as mile markers. And that's where we're, we get the word milestones. And now we celebrate in life, and psychologists and sociologists tell us alike the importance of recognizing milestones in our lives. It gives us a sense of stability, security, and it anchors us to our future when we recognize milestones in life. And in Jewish culture, they recognize a significant milestone by what we call a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah. It recognizes a significant milestone. So as a church family, we recognize some milestones that have been accomplished in some young people's lives today. They have promoted from middle school or junior high school or graduated from high school as a milestone building toward the future that God has for them. And so graduates, as I prepare to share your stories today. I want to give you an encouragement. Lots of times you're going to hear from Christians who are going to tell you God has a wonderful plan for your life, and that is a truth. God has a wonderful plan for your life, but I want to change the word wonderful because when we hear the word wonderful, sometimes we think that means God has a smooth sailing plan for our life. Let's change the word wonderful to God has an adventuresome plan for your life. <laughs> It's still wonderful, but it's not a smooth sailing road. It's an adventuresome road that gets to a wonderful destination when we follow God's plan. But along the way, there's adventure. <laughs> there's adventure that comes our ways and, and unexpected turns. So our first graduate promoting from middle school is Jacob Kane. <laughs> you can wait. <laughs> that applause was started by Jacob himself. <laughs> so there's a personality cue for you. Um, he's promoting from Pioneer Middle School, and during his middle school years, he was on the yearbook team, um, on the basketball team, and he, he literally battled for good grades to make the honor roll several semesters during his middle school experience. Now, one of the quirks about Jacob's personality is Jacob loves amusement parks. Um, he more loves the idea of amusement parks uh, he has a fear of roller coasters. So last year we went to Disneyland, and I, I really thought we kind of worked through the fear of roller coasters because, you know, he was in the line, he went through, and after each ride it was, yeah, it was good, I'm, I'm so, and he rode most of the rides that, that time. But this summer we went to Magic Mountain. 
And so Jacob was in line with the group. We're getting to the roller coaster, and we'd start to load on the coaster, and he'd just step right through. <laughs> if through the line was enough ride for him, <laughs> for Jacob. Uh, but he has a lot of bravery in a lot of other ways. Jacob is heading to Sierra Pacific High School next year. Jacob, come on up here. So now we can give you a little applause. Congratulations. We're proud of you. No, you can go back. You don't have to give a speech. <laughs> um, next, graduating from high school, Gabriel Cantrell. Graduating from Heartland Charter Academy, uh, Gabriel achieved, that's the cute picture, isn't it? <laughs> Gabriel <laughs> achieved a GPA above 4.0 and completed college units as well during his high school journey. All this while for the past two years, Gabriel also held down two jobs concurrently doing this high school and college stuff. So that tells you a little bit about the commitment level of this guy. Um, J uh, Gabriel's always had a quick wit, um, and that quick wit com also paired with a love of French fries. Um, <laughs> when he was three years old, and Abby had to be, what, one maybe? They're sitting around the table, and Gabriel's eyeing her fries, and quickly he says, Abby, there's the little mermaid, Ariel. She looks away, and before she can look back, those fries are demolished. <laughs> Gabriel will be attending a gap year program at Radiant Church in Visalia next year, after which he plans to attend West Hills College, and he's in... Yeah, and he doesn't know what he's going to major in yet. I don't think he's figuring that out as well we should when we're starting college. Gabriel, come on up here. We celebrate you. Well done. Thank you. That too. And I'll tell you, I'm one of Gabriel's bosses at the Art Center. He's a good employee, <laughs> even balancing two jobs in high school. Next high school graduate is Logan Fleming. He's graduating from Hanford West High School. <laughs> Yep, the cute picture. Um, so Logan was a water polo MVP, uh, first and first team All-Valley. He was the Male Scholar Athlete of the Year, uh, won the President's Award for Outstanding Excellent Academic Excellence, and had graduate distinction for carrying a 4.0 or higher all four years of high school. Never dipped below 4.0. Super impressive. Um, and he also served on ASB for all four years of his high school journey. So as a kid, not much older than the cute picture, um, uh, Logan's parents were on the board of directors at the local um, Cal Ripken Baseball League. So Kara was constantly in the concession stand. And Scott was constantly either coaching or helping other coaches or managing all kinds of things around. And so Logan was a free Roman baseball kid all around the, the park and all that whole time. So one time, Kara's working the concession stand and Scott's, I don't know where, and someone comes and reports, there's a kid peeing in the sea train. <laughs> and Kara can't get away from the concession stand so she sends one of the other board members out to check out who this is, and the board member comes back and says, Kara, it was Logan. <laughs> but don't worry, I didn't tell anybody else that it was the president's kid who was peeing in the sea train. <laughs> so little Logan with his pants down around his ankles and his little bottom for the whole world to see, peeing in the sea train unit. <laughs> Logan's continuing on to college. Um, and his hopes are to pursue a career in computer sciences. I didn't see Logan here this morning. We'll give him his gift to take home, but give him a hand in absentia. <laughs> we are proud of you, Logan. Alyssa Needham graduated from Hanford High School. <laughs> and in, she was involved in the Color Guard, and the, during her senior year was the captain of the Color Guard team. Um, so... Uh, uh, Alyssa's always been motherly and very protective of her younger siblings, kind of always taking care of things, very protective. Um, and so one day, out on a walk with the, f the younger kids, and uh, was it Katie in a wagon? 
Chloe, little tiny Chloe, in a wagon, and Alyssa's pulling Chloe in the wagon, and all of a sudden, out of the darkness behind the bushes, comes a roaring, yapping chihuahua, <laughs> charging Alyssa and Chloe, and Alyssa drops the handle of the wagon and runs off, leaving poor <laughs> Chloe to face the chihuahua on her own. <laughs> Alyssa's going to be enlisting in the U.S. Navy, and luckily there's no chihuahuas at sea. So America is safe in the hands of Alyssa as she joins the Navy and is attending basic training at the Great Lakes Naval Base in Chicago. Congratulations, Alyssa. Come on up here. We are very proud of you. Thank you. Okay, congratulations to all of our graduates. Um, it's Promotion Sunday, and we'll talk a little bit later about um, kids coming up to youth group as well. Right now, we're continuing our message series um, called Peaks and Valleys, what, what God is up to in the rough times of life. We've talked about the difference between trials and testings and tribulations. Um, we've talked about where God is at in those things. Today, we're going to talk about um, God's use of trials. We've talked about the fact that trials come from many sources. That's where we started from. And that a trial can be a test, um, and it can be um, a tribulation, but it, a trial is the general term for struggles in life when we see that word in the Bible, when trials come. Here's what James chapter 1, verses 2 through 5 says. James boldly says, Consider it pur pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so you may become mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Now here's what Romans 8.28 says. And we know that in all things, now all things, I've said before, when God uses the word all, he really means all. Not, there's no exception here. He doesn't mean all the good things, all the easy things, all the simple things. All the trials too. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of God, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So James first points us to this. He says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, because at the end, there's something worthy, there's something valuable that comes at the end of whatever trial you're up to. And Paul says in Romans that in all these things, including trials, God is working together for good. And then he describes what the good is. He says that you're going to be conformed to the image of God. You're going to be conformed to the image of God. That's what, whenever a trial happens, regardless of where it comes from, God's intent is to take it and use it to move you forward toward the image that we're created to hold the image that was broken and contaminated at the fall in the garden. So let's look a little bit at how this takes place. God uses trials, if you're following along the outline, God uses trials to strengthen our faith. God uses trials to strengthen our faith. That's what he's doing. So James says, this is when you need perseverance. As you persevere through trials, you're building spiritual muscle, and that spiritual muscle develops character, right? And character, that's a direct correlation to the image of God in us, the character of Christ, the image of God in us. Let's look at the example of Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah was one of the kings of Judah. After the uh, Jewish nation split and uh, the, the nation of Israel was taken into captivity, Judah remained sovereign for a while, and Hezekiah was one of the kings. Hezekiah's name means God strengthened me. It's a great name. Makes, I need to have another kid named Hezekiah. <laughs> nope, I'm not going to have more kids. <laughs> uh, now, Hezekiah was the son of Ahaz, and if you've 
read the Old Testament at all, Ahaz naturally comes to mind as one of the worst possible kings that Judah ever had. Under Ahaz, Ahaz allowed uh, idols to be built in synagogues all around the country. Um, Ahaz eventually closed, locked, sealed the doors of the temple so that no worship would take place in the temple of God in the nation of Israel, in the nation of Judah. Now, Hezekiah, following his ungodly father, is an absolute contrast. Hezekiah swept through the land, tore down every idol and Asherah pole, got rid of them all, opened the doors of the temple so that worship would be restored. And he did all of this while he was facing um, attacks from nations around Judah at that time. And God gave him, gave him uh, honor because he was doing all the right things, and he blessed him, and he was successful at pushing off all the attacks of restoring worship in the nation of Israel, and he prospered in that time. But during that prospering, God revealed to Hezekiah something. He revealed that he had become proud and spiritually lazy during prosperity. So get this, when there was adversity during the time of trial, Hezekiah could stay focused and keep pushing to God and moving forward. Some of us have that personality. Like when we're challenged, we can focus on the goal and just push through. But then when God prospered him, Hezekiah started relaxing a little bit. And he got spiritually lazy and he became proud. And so at some point, the Babylonians began to try to sway Hezekiah. The Babylonians are going to eventually move in after Hezekiah's rule and they're going to take over the nation of Judah. They, they bring gifts to Hezekiah to try to sway him. Here's what 2 Chronicles 32, 31 says. When the envoys who were sent by the rulers of Babylon to ask him about this miraculous sign that had occurred in the land... God left him, Hezekiah. God left him to test him so that he'd know everything that was in his heart. Now, God didn't need to know what was in Hezekiah's heart. He already knew. God knows those things. We saw in the life of Jesus, he consistently knew what people were up to. He could tell their heart. God already knew by omniscience what was in Hezekiah's heart. But during this time where he's being plied with gifts, right? It's the test. Are you going to give in to the Babylonians? Are you, going to, are you going to follow in your father's footstep and now start making treaties with these people who are wanting to sweep over the land and take out God's people? And God left Hezekiah. And as this thing, if you read further on in Second Chronicles, Hezekiah becomes deathly sick. So sick that Second Kings records Isaiah going to Hezekiah at this time and saying, you need to get your affairs in order because you're going to meet your maker. This is bad. You're about to die, Hezekiah. Go get your stuff worked out. But as Hezekiah takes a spiritual inventory and recognizes his distance from God, he gets himself back on track. He doesn't take the treaty with the Babylonians and God raises him up from the sickbed. A trial can help us take a spiritual self-inventory and recognize where we're at spiritually. And so it, one of the things we can do during a trial is take a step back, take a moment of reflection. I was listening to a speaker on a podcast other, and he said one of the strongest personal spiritual disciplines he personally undertook was to take a 40-minute walk every morning that about 20 minutes into his walk after his endorphins are moving around and his, he's done looking at everybody else's yard on his walk, then his mind gets clear and he can clearly hear what God's saying to him in the brisk morning air. And he's just cleared himself of everything else. Spiritual self-inventory. It's an important thing and trials lead us to that place. The example of Habakkuk. Habakkuk was a prophet at the same time as Hezekiah was king, just before Judah was taken into, into captivity. Um, Judah's people, um, after Hezekiah, had left God once again. The Chaldeans see an opportunity to overthrow Judah, and they're on the way. And God says that because of Judah's unfaithfulness, he's going to let the Chaldeans sweep through the land. 
he's going to let him. But he promises Habakkuk this. He says, after that, after that, I'm going to drive your enemy out. So in the midst of the Chaldeans sweeping over his nation, here's what Habakkuk says in Habakkuk 3, 17 through 18. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails, and the field produces no food. So here's what he's saying. The Chaldeans have swept through and they've burned it all, right? That's how you defeat a nation back in the day. You eliminate their ability to supply their own food source, right? We're seeing that happen in Eastern Europe right now. You deplete their sources of food, and that's part of the enemy. So Habakkuk's saying, so all of that's happened. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, Yet, I'll rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. What did Habakkuk need to rejoice when things are going bad? Look, James says, consider it pure joy when you face trials. Habakkuk is showing us how that works. Habakkuk was able to focus on the word of the Lord. I'm going to defeat your enemy. God wants us to develop the ability to look past our trial to his blessing on the other side. You know, in the 23rd Psalm, when, the, when David's talking about how a shepherd leads a sheep through a very dark valley, and he uses his rod and his staff to make sure they don't wander off the, off the path, to make sure they don't wander into dark dens because the sheep is not seeing what's going on all around. The reason the Lord prompts us as we walk through difficulties is to point us to the hilltop on the other side of the valley. Our focus has to remain beyond. And so Hezekiah had strong faith. He needed strong faith to worship in the midst of adversity, and that's what was being developed through his trial. The example of Job. We know Job's story. Satan gets permission from God to test Job on every side, and Job goes through every kind of adversity imaginable. Listen to what Job says at the end of it all in Job 42, 5 through 6. He says, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. You know what he's saying? I should have believed you when you told me. I was so foolish, I waited until I had to see you do it, until I believed you. Why didn't I believe you when you said it to begin with? Through adversity, God developed eyes that see for Job. Isn't that what Jesus said that we needed? Ears that hear and eyes that see. And Job is saying, now I got it. I can see by hearing instead of waiting to see by seeing. Second thing, as we talk about how God transforms us through trials, is that God uses trials to untether us from worldly things. God uses trials to untether us from worldly things. Because the longer we go through life, the more things we accumulate, right? If you took a look in my garage, you would see testimony (laughs) of the things we accumulate and just are in boxes waiting for use at some point. But it's not just things and things and, you know, there's stuff. But we also accumulate pride. We also accumulate a sense of influence. We also accumulate security in the wrong places. When we're younger, we think that those things are what are going to make us safe, right? If I just had the right house, if I just had the right car, if I just had the right people in my life, if I just had the bigger TV, all of these things are going to make, they're going to do it for me. If I just had the right job, if I just got the next promotion, if I just had enough money. In all those ways, as we, when we're younger, we think those things are going to fix it all. And as we get older, we look back and go, you know what? 
probably happier when I didn't have all of this to worry about. It was probably easier when I didn't have all of this to juggle. It was probably simpler when I didn't carry all this stuff around where I go. An interesting episode in the life of Jesus when he's on a boat with his disciples and he's been preaching up a storm, so he's exhausted. He's exhausted. And he falls asleep in the boat. And a storm comes up. Here's Matthew 8, 23 through 27. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you have little faith. You of little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up, and he rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. You know, he wasn't upset that they woke him up. In fact, waking him up was the right thing to do. He rebuked them for being afraid. And you know what made them afraid? They thought the boat was their answer. And the boat was failing them. The boat was going to sink because the boat could not manage the storm. Jesus needed to manage the storm. But because their were, eyes were only seeing the boat and the boat was failing to do what they thought the boat was there for, they were afraid. And so in so many instances, as we go through life and the things we thought were going to help us make it through, the things that we thought were going to give us our sense of self, whatever, esteem, fail to do it. We have this chance to untether ourselves from that unqualified faith. You know, Moses grew up as a prince in Egypt, with property and power and education and adulation. And when he recognized his true identity, he faced a crisis of identity because he saw his own people being mistreated. And when he became so overwhelmed by the struggles of his own people that he couldn't remain silent any longer, that was his trial. Listen to what Moses chose in Hebrews eleven twenty five through 26. Moses chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. You know what trials can do? They can show us what we really love. They can show us what we really love. Trials take us to a point of decision-making where we're going to decide what we love and what we rely on. I... Thirdly, God uses trials to point us to our eternal hope. You know, as eternal citizens of heaven, we should be growing less and less content in this world, and less and less connected to this world as we grow in Christ. In fact, that's a, a good signal, it's a good measurement for ourselves as we do self-inventory as to what kind of progress we're making as we grow in Christ. How am I still as connected to the things of this world as I was before? Am I growing more connected to eternity and less connected to things? That's a great self-evaluation tool for ourselves. Each encounter with the brokenness of this world, or the brokenness of the people around us, or our own brokenness, as we grow in Christ, each of those encounters develop in us a longing, a longing for home, a longing for our eternal hope. And so when we come upon those trials, when someone else's stupid decisions and stupid stupidness, right? 
messes up our life comes pouring down in our laps, causes significant hazard in our life. When those things happen, and they do, because the world is so broken, it develops, God is developing in us a recognition, this isn't your final spot. This isn't your final spot. Scripture tells us that we're journeyers here on this planet, and we're only on our way through. That eventually we're going to reach our true home because we are citizens not of this place, but of heaven. Listen to what 2 Corinthians says about this. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore we don't lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. And inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Remember the church in Corinth struggling as a congregation by being affected by the world around them. And Paul is telling them, look, you keep doing, you keep turning to the things of this world instead of the things of God, and you keep crashing into the brokenness of this world. And so you're starting to feel like there's no hope. Well, of course you do. This wasting away in this world that you're feeling is because this world is not for you anymore not for you anymore. In 2 Corinthians, a few verses earlier, he says this about that wasting away. We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. The life of Jesus is eternal life. When trials come, God has every intention of using it for good, no matter where it comes from. And it can come from lots of sources, which we've already talked about. And what God's plan is, that good that God plans for us, is to develop the character of Christ in us. As our growing faith focuses us on eternal things and shifts our love away from the world and toward our Savior, we become more in character with God, more in the image of God that he's planned for us. This is the audacity with which James says, consider it pure joy. Because every trial you face, you're being disconnected a little bit more from this broken place. And what better thing is there than to get disconnected from this broken place. Consider it pure joy. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. Paul said it's, you know, we're hard pressed. We're struck down. Of course it's bad. It's rough. But there's joy in knowing that through that rough patch we're being made more like God and we're heading closer and closer to our true home where brokenness doesn't rule anymore. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. And I know that some of us are in trials right now. Some of us face serious financial struggles. I know that there are people who aren't here today because they face serious health issues. I know that some of us are struggling with broken relationships that we really long to see put back together. I know that some of us in our own home feel darkness creeping in on the relationships that make up our home. And we're in a trial. God's not done. We can look past what we see to what he's promised. That's what Job learned. I should have listened. You're the Savior. Listen, you, you know what God's best thing is? 
what God does innately without trying. You know, when I watch people like uh, Michael Phelps swim, it's like he's not trying. It's graceful and easy. It's second nature. And you know what God's nature is? Redeeming stuff. He does it without trying. He does it with ease. And it looks beautiful on him because it's what he spends his time doing. He redeems things. And if you're a broken moment in time, you know that you're God who just redeems things because that's who he is, the redeemer. You know, he's at work to carry you through, to get you to the hill on the other side of the valley, and to bring good. Let's stand together and worship.
God, to be the healer for those who need healing this morning. In the name of Jesus, bodies restored, sickness cast out, illness defeated. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Lord, I pray for everyone who's facing the unknown. And it looks so unknowable. And the way doesn't look possible. God, you make a way where there is no way. God, I pray right now you would pave unseen paths before your people and like you opened the sea for your nation of Israel to pass through the Red Sea, Lord, open a way. Make a way to pass on solid, dry ground for your people who are struggling today. God, redeem relationships and put them back together in the name of Jesus. Restore families in the name of Jesus. Heal broken hearts. Heal wounded minds. Lord, make us new. Fill us with your spirit again. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that it is your nature to redeem and renew and restore. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated for just a moment. Well, if you're a guest with us today, thanks for being with us. We're glad to have you here. If you'll fill out a little welcome card back on the back table, it'll help us get to know you, which is our goal. You know, we're a small church. We want to feel like family. And unless we know you, we can't do that. So fill out that card. We've got a little gift for you. It includes a Starbucks card, some chocolates, an uh, epic mug, so you can ID yourself as an epic mug-carrying participant, <laughs> if anybody does that. <laughs> um, but that's back there for you. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better. That'll help us out. So this Thursday, we're back at the uh, market night at Epic. It's the right before the 4th of July weekend, so we think there are, usually is a pretty good-sized crowd at this market night. We do need a full team of volunteers, and if you haven't been yet, it's a really fun evening just helping kids have a great time, and you'd be surprised how many people just walk up to have their kids do a craft, play an easy game, um, and uh, the extroverts will be there to do the talking if you're not that person. So, <laughs> but just come out and enjoy watching and connecting with our community, being there to show our community that we love them. We're here for them. It's it's very significant message that we send to the people of Hanford as Epic Church, who's planted right here on Main Street, the Main Street in town. We got to say we love you, Hanford. We got to say it. Um, we can use your help. You can sign up on the back table there, so we know that you're available for us. That'd be great. Youth groupers and upcoming youth groupers, if you're promoting up to youth groups, so if you're moving from fifth grade to sixth grade when you start school, the next school year you're a sixth grader, youth group tonight, um, we have mounds of ice cream in store for you for tonight. Um, we're looking forward to having you, so plan on being here. Um, we start officially at 6, we open the youth lounge at 5.30, so there's plenty of hangout time to play ping pong and enjoy one another before we get started, and then um, we'll introduce you to all that's going on tonight. It's going to be a great evening of fun together this evening. God bless you all, and I, I know that if your eyes are focused, you're going to see what God's up to in your life, even in the trials that you're facing this week.